Welcome to our first forum of the year. Are democracies in peril? That's how we're kicking off the year. There's a story about Benjamin Franklin that's probably apocryphal, that as he was coming out of the Constitutional Convention, a woman stops him and says, Doctor, tell me, are we a democracy or a monarchy? And he says, we're a democracy for now. And so I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists here. Uh, rather than read you their bios, you can look them up, right? Their names and their, their long titles there. I just, I asked them each to uh, tell me their uh, a seminal memory or experience of democracy. I'll tell you my own experience of democracy that was, I, my father was a career foreign service officer in the US State Department. And I remember being in the second grade in Surabaya, Indonesia, and having uh, a group of non-Americans in my second grade class explain to me what a democracy was. And I never forgot it, it was kind of wonderful. Um, uh, Marshall, Marshall told a story about um, accompanying the first African-American voter to register to vote at the Amite County Courthouse in Liberty, Mississippi in the spring of 1965. The last person who tried to register had done so two years before, Herbert Lee, and he was shot and killed in front of the courthouse immediately afterwards by the then state senator. Who would go first was a toss-up between Herbert Lee Jr. and Ben Faust, who claimed to be 104, had been born a slave bent over from years of picking cotton, and who swore there was one thing he wanted to do before he died, and that was register to vote. He went first, and Marshall was there. Jenny, hold the applause. Hold your applause to the end of the semester. <laughs> Jenny described her father, who had come from England from a middle-class family, but he'd gone to university at Cambridge, but he hated the English class system where you could tell uh, someone's class by their accents within two seconds of speaking with them. And he loved the fact that Jenny was in a small class in a public school with the children of tenant farmers and factory workers. And it really, that experience stayed with her, that it's not a political democracy, but it's about what Tocqueville meant when he conceived of democracy in America. Khalil, Khalil talked about election day in 2008 when he went, he was living in Bloomington, Indiana, and he was part of a get out the vote effort for uh, uh, the candidate then Barack Obama. And about two miles off campus, he knocked on a home and, and an older white man took great offense to him, stepped out of the, his house and told Khalil he was not welcome on the property and wanted him to leave immediately. And although Obama went on to make history a few hours later, Khalil writes, I could see firsthand how much anger and bitterness some folks carried in their hearts over that presidential election. As a black man in a nearly 90% white county in a state that hadn't voted for a Democrat in 44 years, I walked a little taller the day after the election, but stayed close to home. <laughs> Megan, Megan told me about uh, right after Saddam had been uh, Saddam Hussein had, uh, had lost power in Iraq. She was traveling around the country speaking to a really wide range of Iraqis to ask them what they wanted for their country. And all of them said, a government that we can hold accountable. Danny, Danny writes about, write, wrote to me about um, in 2010 when his father-in-law was jailed by Erdogan in Turkey along with hundreds of other government uh, opponents. And it's not a pleasant memory, but it really sets the stage for some of the things he wants to talk about, about global norms. And finally, Catherine says she grew up in South Dakota and Minnesota and didn't think too much about democracy until she was an exchange student in 1976 in Uruguay in the darkest days of the dictatorship and finally began to understand what the absence of democracy might mean. And so with that, please welcome our panelists. I'm going to ask each of them to briefly speak about this question, are democracies in peril? Just give us a brief 
like three to five minute take. And then we're gonna get into some discussion up here between the panelists. And then we're gonna open it up to questions from all of you. Really looking forward to a robust, provocative, exciting discussion. Marshall, take it away. Are we supposed to stand or sit? You can sit. I'll oh. give you permission. Oh, thank you. All right, good. Uh, yeah, five minutes is a tough constraint. I, I, I just heard three minutes, so I don't know. Yeah. I'm always pushing But uh, no, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read quickly. So, because um, this seems like a very, probably the most critical topic we have to deal with right now. Um, at this time of almost daily political, moral, and social assaults uh, emanating from the White House, uh, many of which are linked to calls for immediate action, it's easy to see Donald Trump as the problem rather than the evidence of a much deeper set of problems in American democracy that have had years in the making. Political scientist Sid Verba once observed that liberal democracy is a promise that this form of government can enable equality of voice to balance inequality of resources. Um, and uh, I would add, and whether access to those resources depends on wealth, race, gender, or, or as is most often the case, a combination of all three. It was de Tocqueville who recognized that making democracy work, though, would depend on what he called knowledge of how to combine or how to organize. He understood civic associations, parties, churches, to be great schools of democracy in which individuals could learn to discern their common interests, equip themselves with skills of self-government, and develop the empathy to support solidaristic action. Going well beyond the aggregation of individual voices to the creation of collective capacity, this could make a whole greater than the sum of its parts. In other words, it takes the power of organized people to make democracy work. In the US, this has been a challenging balance to strike as a result of the inequality built into our electoral structures crafted 250 years ago to preserve the power of local elites of the day, accommodate slave states and free, and small states and large, by the first by the post winner take all elections, the Electoral College, and a Senate in which 400,000 citizens in Wyoming have the same number of votes too as 25 million citizens in California. From time to time, however, associations like those de Tocqueville described, many of them organized to link local, state, and national action, incubated social movements, movements of moral reform that could overcome the fragmentation such as temperance, abolition, agrarian reform, suffrage, labor reform, civil rights, conservation, and so forth. Much of the time, when their focus was on broadening equality, they strengthened democracy. At other times, when they were in reaction to efforts to broaden equality, they weakened democracy. Since 1976, however, this balancing act got harder when the US Supreme Court decided in Buckley v. Verleo that money is speech crushing efforts to expand equal voice by limiting campaign spending, the demand, trying instead to limit campaign contributions, supply, which in the face of an almost insatiable demand driven by the development of new information technologies, new specialties, and a new class of professionals who built what Adam Scheingate calls a business of politics, which in the 2012 election cycle earned some $8.2 billion. I'll come back and say more about that. This has reduced the power of organized people, volunteer-based organizing that depends on engagement with a motivated, committed, and active constituency while enhancing the power of wealth. Why bother with volunteers except for photo ops when there's much more profit to be made using social media, earned media, and purchased media, all of which yield far, higher, far more profitable commissions than training volunteers? At the same time, advocacy groups seem to confuse organizing, engaging people to work with each other, with mobilizing, gets of lots of tweets to Twitter, or even turning out lots of people to protest one time. But without building the collective capacity to do so strategically, in which, the very, which produced very mixed results documented by Zainab Tufeci in her new book, Twitter and Tear Gas. Another consequence of this turn has been, with few exceptions, to abandon financial reliance on dues-paying constituency in favor of dependency on the largesse of donors, often beneficiaries of the very policies many of the advocacy groups would like to change. Given all this, is it really surprising the steady growth of neoliberal ideology, policies, and practices which have undermined the legitimacy, capacity, and effectiveness of the most important form of organized people democratic government itself. 
and is in many ways in the absence of an effective progressive response responsible for the creation of a constituency so ripe for the Donald Trumps of this world. But as Tom Hayden once said, change is slow except when it's fast. <laughs> and we are in a fast moment right now. Chickens come home to roost, inconvenient truths confront us, small differences can yield big changes like 70,000 votes, and the choices we make really matter. So as another American radical, radical labor organizer and songwriter, Joe Hill exclaimed when facing a fire, firing squad, it's not time to mourn, but to organize. Marshall, you saying uh, that democracy is about giving equal voice to, uh, in, in an environment of unequal resources. Yeah. And that movements that uh, embrace broader equality strengthen democracy. Yeah. And so at this moment, democracy, are democracies in peril? Yeah. You believe they're in peril because, of the imba because that equal voice is threatened? Yeah, I think the, the whole way in which wealth has come to dominate the whole political process, and I don't just mean campaign contributions, but I mean even the way campaigns are conducted. They've been turned into marketing operations, not organizing. So the work of politics, which is getting people to engage with each other, learn with each other, act together, doesn't get done. And unfortunately, some of the uh, new technology facilitates the same thing happening in advocacy groups. So what you wind up is a whole lot of marketing of individual stuff, but without creating the collective capacity to really to act together, to learn with each other, and to act with the power we need. But it's not just a vacuum. The vacuum's been filled by this new business. And it's one of the things I think distinguishes us from the Western European uh, demo uh, democracies where there are real constraints on campaign spending. <coughs> we don't really have that. And that's why we have this huge industry here. Uh, and this industry, uh, boy, you announce you're doing anything, boy, they swoop right in. And so trying to rebuild a politics that's people power based is really challenging. And I think, but I also think that we have an opportunity for that right now. As evidenced, for example, by a group like Indivisible that scaffolded 7,000 groups into existence at local areas all over the country. I think the question is whether we can step up and actually turn this around. Jenny. Yeah, well, I hope we'll get back to wealth and organizing. I, I want to talk about the perils of populism. And I'll, I want to define populism first as combining three factors. First is an assumption that the people are unified and purer and better than the corrupt elites. Second, that the establishment and the elites are corrupt and they're the enemy. And third, that a strong leader channels the will of the unified people, stands for that will, and rightly mobilizes it. So they're the three elements of the unified people, corrupt elites, and a strong leader. Now, le left and right-wing populist movements have both of those, all of those characteristics. The right will add to it a fourth element, which is uh, anger and uh, at an outgroup, which is defined as not the people. So we, the unified people, uh, stand with our leader, and then there is this outgroup. So the left wing is kind of dyadic, leader people, and the right wing populism is triadic, leader people, enemy uh, uh, in the marginalized group. So why is this a peril to democracy? First, because it's anti-pluralist in the deepest way. The concept of a unitary people excludes the dissenters, excludes, er, excludes everybody else. Um, and it may fit some early models of democracy, but it doesn't fit what we want democracy to be today, which is inclusive of all citizens. So it's anti-pluralist. And it's also anti-rights. Classical democracy in Athens, I teach about classical democracy in Athens, that didn't come bundled with rights. But democracy has evolved to become democracy plus rights, all intertwined. And the unified people's will, and that whole concept of a unified people's will, it's impatient with this idea of rights. It tends to override rights. So that's populism. Why, what's, what are its causes? Basically, I think, economic insecurity plus good reason to think that the elites don't care. It's not just stupidity, it's correct analysis. And so some of these causes are inequality, globalization, automation, decline in union membership, good jobs concentrating in cities, 
the city's cosmopolitan values becoming dominant, status degradation, when you've only got a high school education and everyone and the average education is going up, the value of yours, your education declines. And then immigration, which is a trigger cause. It's a cause with a human face. So that's the problem. We've been asked to talk about problems and solutions. So I, I, I have lots of suggestions about how to deal with those underlying causes, but I'm not going to explore them now. Here I want to raise something that I don't think the left, for example, has taken seriously enough, which is the trigger cause of immigration. In Europe, including Sweden, the Scandinavian countries, as well as France, Germany, East, Greece, Italy, England, the trigger cause for right-wing populist parties has been immigration. And in the US, immigration was the trigger cause for the Tea Party and the trigger cause for the Trump campaign. Now, by trigger, I mean it sets off, it ignites those underlying causes. It may not be much of a cause itself, but it has a way of igniting these deeper issues. So we need, I think, a better immigration regime where we balance our desire to spread opportunity to people beyond our borders, welcome new people into the country with all the advantages that gives the, us, by the way, the people in this room of diversity, innovation, overall economic growth. We have, need to balance those very good things. Well, I think some sensitivity to managing the pace of change in democracy and a need to attend to the sentiments of those who've been the losers from policies that have by and large been extremely beneficial to everyone in this room. The country's seen some dramatic social changes, thank God. The percentage of immigrants at the last measurement is just one percentage point lower than the highest it's ever been in the United States, 14%. Last time it reached that percentage, it resulted in a punishing anti-immigrant bill. But people can adapt. We all know that. And in the US, we have adapted to a high percentage and a large number of immigrants, to gay marriage, to women's greater power, to lots of sweeping social changes. But the people who've decided to stay where they were born, not moving to the cities, you all have moved to the cities. The people who have not <coughs> moved to the cities are not as good at change as perhaps you all are. And they are also the economic losers where we in this room are the winners. And because the prime locus of discontent is the illegality of some current immigrants, I suggest a solution in which we legalize all current residents of the US. If people, people entered illegally, pay a fine, become legal. At the same time, we should create a verifiable and required social security card and institute strong sanctions against employers for hiring illegal employees. And then we can maintain current levels of immigration. I think this will be controversial, and so I throw it out for our discussion. <laughs> um, until we're able to make all current immigrants in this country legal, we need to support the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Where's Doug? He's somewhere in this room. Uh, anyway, our dean is somewhere in this room, and he wrote a great letter. This Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals is something that we need to support both personally and institutionally, and I'm proud of Harvard and the Kennedy School for doing so. So Jenny, you, you're, you are democracies in peril? You think yes, and that populism is one of the primary dangers. One danger. It is, I think it, growing inequality is a huge danger. I thought others might talk about that. Um, but it is one very important danger that I think we're not paying sufficient attention to the causes of. And that part of your suggested solution or way of helping to rescue democracy is to look more seriously at immigration because of the populist response it provokes. To immigration and to the other ca deeper causes, many of which I, I listed. Um, I picked immigration because I thought it would be the most controversial. I thought if I came out in favor of reducing inequality, most people would you know, agree with me. Um, <laughs> and um, and you know, one of the big questions is, how do we do it? And the answer, is, among other things, is through our tax system. But I, I wanted to touch on immigration because I think we have not given the uh, att serious intellectual attention and can-do spirit that we have at the Kennedy School to thinking through what could be solutions that could be broadly acceptable. Khalil. All right. <clears throat> While there is no question that President Trump is a threat to American democracy, from the Russian involvement in the election itself to his abuse of the emoluments clause to separation of powers,
it isn't clear that the current state of democratic politics in America is not somehow still a rough index of the actual preferences and beliefs of many Americans, in which case democracy is working. Or is the free exchange of ideas and related political participation, including beliefs and alternative facts, for example, functioning as well as it could be expected? I think the answer is yes. This does not mean that the extraordinary influence of a foreign power and evidence of actual voter suppression through new ID laws and greater restrictions on access to polls and voting is not the most explicit evidence of our democracy in peril. But that still leaves us facing existential challenges that precede the 2016 election, such as unprecedented economic inequality, what Archon Fung titles in a recent Boston Review essay, It's the Gap, Stupid, unlimited money in politics, and resurgent white supremacy and low-grade anti-blackness, its more common and invidious cousin, just to name a few. In other words, one could imagine the same panel here today, even if Hillary Clinton were in office, facing an intransigent Republican majority in Congress and state governments, the same Brexit and North Korea threats, and my best guess is that even without President Trump, the tiki torchbearers would have still gathered in Charlottesville to protest the removal of Confederate General Robert E. Lee because an African American high school student a year and a half ago set off the current decision to remove the statute. One way to think about this bold young person's act and the consequences of it is to put, into, put it in the context of the long view of black, small d, democratic politics. In 2012, the political scientist Michael Dawson said, quote, today there is a disconnect between black organizing and other mobilizations on behalf of labor, suffrage, and radical economic reform. Even worse, the black civil society that in the past supported flourishing black activism is today weaker than it was for most of the 20th century. Without a mobilized, that might be someone calling. <laughs> Without a mobilized black politics, American democracy is even more vulnerable to internal attacks by those who have been openly suspicious of mass democratic movements for decades, end quote. If Dawson is right, President Obama's claim that the vision of sharecroppers and their grandchildren who voted for him, was that, that their vision voted for him was achieved in his election should have called for activating a black politics one Dawson defines, defines variously as multiracial and progressive at the national level rather than discarding or transcending it. Because if the legacy of those who struggled for a meaningful place in American democracy inspired what many imagined unachievable, marriage equality for example, why strip the nation of perhaps its greatest asset, its history of political dissent to expand and make meaningful multiracial democracy? I could argue by way of measurement that Glenn Beck and company were exactly right when they claimed Obama's professed universalism was indeed a sly cover for his black agenda. What liberals dismissed as retrograde white supremacy, it turns out, is one side of a shared belief by liberals and conservatives that blackness cannot contain or embody the best of America's democratic traditions. I think here of your voter. This is nothing new. Historian Nikhil Singh has written, quote, American liberalism from Murdoch's An American Dilemma to President Bill Clinton's National Conversation on Race has consistently underestimated or devalued the autonomous dimensions of black political discourse, extolling instead American political culture as the ablest, if not the only, ideological source of black struggles for justice and equality. This vindicationist history of America's self-transcendence of the racial past that dominates the present is predicated upon a national forgetting of what Frederick Douglass called the standpoint of the victims of American history. With history as tailwind, scholar Lisa Duggan predicted months after Obama's election in March of 2009 that because of the crisis of global capitalism, firstborn attached to the placenta of the transatlantic slave trade, she writes, new forms of authoritarian oligarchy, transformed modes of participatory democracy, resurgent xenophobic nationalisms, all of these seem possible as responses to a dramatic economic downturn. So here we are. The Charlottesville riot 
will in the short term galvanize good people to stand up against naked and bold displays of white supremacy and neo-Nazism. But the riot will not galvanize those same people to reject the systemic logic of anti-blackness, which is also anti-Latino, anti-Native, anti-Muslim, and anti-other more generally and extends like toxic smog over queer communities of difference. These all affect immigration, criminal justice, housing, education, and economic development. Don't get me wrong, many white Americans admire, respect, and even love other Americans who happen to be black or Mexican or Muslim. They have a much harder time admiring, respecting, and loving categorically black Americans, Native Americans, Mexican Americans, or Muslim Americans just as they love themselves. Part of this is due to what I call damage imagery. Each of these groups is damaged by dent of their own history or culture or nationality or religion. The price of the ticket, as James Baldwin once said, is to admit the flaws of your separate identity, which means your history, your heritage, and beliefs, renounce yourself and embrace America, which is already marked as white. Most white Americans, even for immigrants, never had to do the same. The government's marked citizenship as white from the beginning and simply expanded the borders of inclusion over time. But the borders of whiteness have never fallen despite the cry of white nationalists. My guess is that they need to spend more time in museums. White identity is the mortar that binds the foundation of every institution in America. It is the air we breathe, the beauty we emulate. It is the culture that borrows, commodifies, and appropriates non-white culture and accomplishment as its own. Even in the age of Obama, to be truly exemplary and successful was to be post-black, as the writer Touré described, or in the words of Washington Post columnist Eugene Robinson, to be transcendent, like Oprah, to move past blackness. So allow me to close with a few recommendations. Some borrowed. One, deal with racial resentment, attack it head on, and build a new civic culture around racial equity that looks to Germany and Canada for clues. Two, Along those lines, a new civic culture must take seriously the need for a new origin story of America. And that work has the potential for making multiracial alliances and social mo movements, in social movements, the truer history of an enlightenment idea of democracy which produced, on its own, gave us a slave republic. The rest came at tremendous cost and sacrifice to real people and not a manifest dream. Immigrants, and Jennifer Hochschild notes, especially Latinos, must be welcomed with greater intentionality into the fold of this history so as to resist the temptation to assimilate into the tired myth of American exceptionalism. Today's DACA decision only makes the matter more urgent. This is precisely the same work, by, way, by the way, that a new civic culture intentionally aims to do among working class white Americans. Four, government must reclaim the role of expressing our collective values and responsibility to each other and not the private marketplace. Five, an anti-tax way of life, the starting point seemingly for every conceivable policy question, is not just an economic debate about how to generate balanced growth with public investment in education and infrastructure, it is also a cultural and spiritual debate about how we view mutual obligations to each other. Six, and the last of these recommendations. The increasing class proximity and economic insecurity of the 80% of black and white and brown will continue to threaten American democracy beyond President Trump's years. Without a fundamental reckoning and reconsideration of what Americans owe each other within the context of a new shared history. To come back to that young black protester in Charlottesville, her legacy is ours to carry forward. The future of American democracy may or may not depend on a reinvigorated black politics or black public sphere. Obama may be the last of that century and a half long journey. But the future does depend, I would argue, on learning that history in all its complexity in order to build an equally durable set of democratic values and practices of dissent to survive another 150 years. Wow. Khalil. The so, our democracy is in peril, yes, yes, but that we might be having the same discussion if Hillary Clinton was president, and that there are a number of underlying factors you brought up, but you really focused on America's history and race in that history.
and our, our inability and resistance in part, on, in part on our public leaders to really engage deeply with that history and, and with the American people, that, that that's, a, that's a real barrier. That's, a, that's part of what's threatening our democracy is our inability to do that work. Is that a fair? Yeah, so the, when I, the line about um, wanting to see evolution as a transcendence over this black problem or this racial past or this, this conundrum <clears throat> that we seem in 50 year increments to somehow move the needle just a little bit further. Uh, and so I wanted to tap into this most recent period, which uh, the Obama two terms represented for many people, certainly at the beginning, as a moment of transcendence. And that language, and I'm not using that other word that, that has now been put in the dustpin of history, uh, but this notion that, um, that to arise to something that moves past race is the ultimate goal. I'm arguing just the opposite here. Um, and I, I shout out, essentially, Germany and Canada as two places um, in the 20th century who've made a commitment not to transcending uh, their racial past, but embracing it as a prophylactic as a societal vaccination against the worst forms of tribalism uh, that can eat at the soul of any democracy. Um, and they seem to be doing much better than we are, so. <laughs> we have a lot to draw on from the notion of dissent helping us to get to where we all claim to be proud to be, and yet we keep falling back into this abyss uh, that um, won't go away. Wow. Megan. I feel, I feel like I got about five forums worth of discussion, and we didn't even get to the second half of the panel yet. <laughs> Great. Megan. Thank you, and uh, good evening, everyone. Usually, um, when I'm sitting here, I'm talking to you about foreign policy, but tonight I have the opportunity to talk a little bit about U.S. politics, and I'm happy for that opportunity. My comments are going to be simple and brief. Um, I know that there's a lot of opinions here we want to hear. Before I make them, I want to acknowledge a very good friend, E.J. Dion, who is a visiting professor uh, with us for this semester. He has written on this topic widely, and I wish you could join us up here. I hope you'll contribute to the discussion. Um, I think at this moment in American politics, it's easy to be filled with despair. And I certainly have seen a lot of that uh, in our classrooms, in my office hours, uh, in the hallways, the streets, not just of Cambridge, but of other parts of America as well. But I also feel that um, while it, it, that there's no, uh, it's not a time for complacency, but I don't see complacency. And that's actually one of the things that um, if I could dare interject a tiny bit of optimism into the conversation, you know, one of the things that does make me optimistic is I don't think um, certainly people in this room, but much beyond this room, have met this historical moment with complacency, and I think that is really important to acknowledge. Um, there's one other thing I'd like to put out there. It might be controversial, but I think it's also worth mentioning, and at least in my view, um, we're not in a crisis of liberal democracy per se, maybe a crisis of our political parties, and I'll say a few words about that. But I don't see a really active and vibrant debate in our country, and I'm happy about this, about whether liberal democracy is actually the right form of governance for this country. That we're debating a lot of things, and a lot of very important issues have been raised, but I don't see people making the argument and gaining traction that a different form of governance would be better suited to America, to Americans. And that a liberal democracy, one that is a representative government, one that is civilian led, and hopefully, or it really should ensure the rights of all citizens, that that is still the superior way in which to resolve our differences and tackle our problems, which are huge. Now, so while I might not answer the question, is this a crisis of liberal democracy, uh, affirmatively, I would say we are having a real crisis of our political parties. And there, I'd say both of our political parties are really not living up to the moment in terms of what we need them to do to ensure that populism um, doesn't turn into authoritarianism or something else. Um, and I'll say a word about each party. I'll be bipartisan in that regard, I guess. Um, on the Democratic side, I would say, and this is not exclusively the role of the Democratic Party, but as the party of opposition, so to speak, I would say there's a particular responsibility and role for that party to really think about 
policies and prescriptions and platforms to address the social and economic ills that really are at the heart of populism. I think we've touched on a lot of things that are behind this uh, particular political moment, and I don't wanna say that one is totally dominant over the others, but I do feel like there's a real crisis of economics and mobility in our country, and one that requires some really innovative thinking and new policy prescriptions. Um, we can call it whatever we want, but certainly this problem of, uh, or you know, call it problem or it, the, this reality of technological change, I think is one that is with us for the long run, and it is exacerbating this huge gap in our country, and it is creating more and more of a distance between those who have, which we happen to be in this room, and those who have not. And that is corrosive to democracy. And so what are we going to do? What are the specific prescriptions we're going to pursue? Um, again, not exclusive to the Democratic Party's responsibility, but hopefully as a party of the opposition, this would be where they would really put forward some alternative ideas. On the Republican Party side, I also see this party falling down in the face of uh, its responsibilities of this historical moment. Um, Daniel Ziblatt, who is also from Harvard, recently wrote a book about conservatism. And he looks at the history of conservative parties and talks about that where populism is stopped from being a real challenge to democracy is when conservative parties actually uh, take responsibility. And in the, what he's describing is a situation where the right of the conservative party, because obviously it's not monolithic, actually are, um, is taken on by the moderate conservatives. And what we would like to see, what I would like to see as a Republican, is conservative Republicans to take on the right wing of the conservative party and not to see the right wing of the conservative party as a vehicle for approaching particular economic or other political agendas, but to really actually call out the right um, when it is violating the values and principles that a lot of conservatism does stand for. Um, this sounds very abstract, but let me give you an example. We saw this in the French elections just uh, in the spring. We saw Fillon, who is a real conservative, come out against Marie Le Pen, who was even to the right of him, in support of a candidate which, who was Macron, who was effectively a socialist or had just recently departed the Socialist Party. So you saw the moderate conservative part come out against the far right in favor of an alternative vision, one that was much more inclusive. So again, there's a lot to be done. I think we've begun to touch on it, but those are some of the ideas I wanted to throw out this evening. But Megan, you don't sound like you're that convinced that democracies are in peril. Well, I mean, when you say democracy, you're talking about every democracy in the world. Uh, I mean, I think there's challenges across the board. They're very different in, in the nature. Is American democracy in peril? Um, you know, I'm worried about a lot of things, but they tend to be a little bit more specific than that particular charge, because I actually think um, that we do, to answer Marshall's question, do we have the ability to right ourselves? Do we have the ability to reform? Do we have the ability to actually take charge of our system? And I think the answer to that is yes. So um, I would say I'm concerned, but not despairing. How does that work? That's good. I was hoping for a more contrarian point of view, <laughs> but we'll take it. Yeah. Danny. Concern. One thing that happens when, when you watch um, a country like Turkey um, uh, devolve into um, a really um, authoritarian regime in a number of, of a few years is, is you get a better sense of how you would make a distinction whether a democracy is in, in peril or not. And I think there, is, um, there, are, there are two things that happen in very rapid order uh, in, in Turkey and, and actually many other countries um, uh, that have gone through a similar process recently um, and uh, that are, that have, I don't think have so far happened in the United States, but I think are, 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 are going to be the, the test. Um, one is what happens with the judiciary. Um, that is, uh, do you have an independent judiciary or the judiciary becomes completely subordinated uh, 
uh, to the government, um, the prime minister or the president. Um, and, and that essentially in Turkey, in, literally in a few years, um, it was a complete transformation there. The second is, is what happens uh, with the media. Um, are, is, the, is the media, the mainstream media, still remain uh, a voice of um, significant diversity of opinion? Uh, or, um, as in fact happens in a country uh, in Turkey, is, is, isn't a sort of explicit censorship as much as self-censorship, that people are simply um, uh, afraid of uh, expressing views that they might view as, as, as uh, going against what the government's wishes. Um, so when I look at the United States from that perspective, uh, it's, it's, sort of, it's, it's what's going to happen to the judiciary under Trump, what's going to happen to the media under Trump. I think mean, those become really the, the critical issues. I, it's not democracy that's in peril. Um, maybe we'll disagree a little bit with, with Megan, but it's liberal democracy in peril. I mean, because Erdogan was elected democ democratically. Viktor Orban was elected democratically. Rodrigo Duterte was elected democratically. Uh, Nicolas Maduro was elected democratically. Um, but of course, what those countries have seen is essentially this process of the subordination of the judici judiciary and the rule of law um, and, and a free media under, sort of, uh, under total government control. And that's really the key test for the United States, whether these, the fact that these institutions have much greater historical continuity and of a history, whether they will, that will actually save them from uh, the kind of assault that, that clearly um, we've already seen, uh, but have had, uh, I think, luckily, um, a very, relatively little impact. Now, I mentioned a number of countries, and I started from Turkey. That, that's, I think, it's an important message that this phenomenon is a global phenomenon. So when, you know, the United States has a lot of problems. When we're talking about populism, this is a global phenomenon. Um, and I think, and therefore, to understand it, that suggests that there must be something common that's going on, uh, that's that's driving this, uh, and that that the particular uh, cleavages and divisions and problems around which populists wrap themselves in order to provide a platform might be very context specific, might be very country specific. Maybe it's going to be immigration in one country. Maybe it's going to be foreign corporations, as it is in Latin America often. Uh, or it's going to be uh, the United States as it is in Turkey too often. So the, the, the other, the enemy, might be different. Uh, but the, the question is what is the common uh, uh, forces that's driving this? Um, I think there's two, two things. One is, I think, one basically is structural phenomenon that's, that liberal democracy is, is very hard to maintain. I think it's historically, it's, a, it's an exception. When you think about who is the political constituency for a liberal democracy, uh, they are the minority, they are the excluded groups, they are the people whose, whose rights would be violated in an illiberal democracy. Uh, they are the ideological, ethnic, racial, religious minorities whose, whose rights would be trampled under an illiberal democracy, and by their very nature, they don't have any political weight in the system. Yes, the majority, the people want elect elections so they can, they can actually militate against the elite, uh, but uh, there isn't uh, a political constituency uh, for a liberal democracy. And I think that makes liberal democracy fundamentally, historically, very weak, suggesting that maybe this is a very, you know, we've just gone through a very uh, uh, exceptional period. Um, but I think also the commonality that this is also happening around across a very wide range of countries suggests that there is something which is um, a, a process of, if, if you will, uh, you know, marketization, globalization, autom auto uh, autom uh, the sort of changes in technology, uh, which have created a lot of economic insecurity, a lot of inequity at the same time as uh, governments in a lot of places have given up their social responsibilities. Um, and, and, and the welfare states have been weakened and, and the sort of there's been a disjuncture between the growth of these market insecurities uh, and, and, and the, role of the, uh, uh, the role of the government in providing uh, some of the protections, in part because I think the elites have hidden behind a kind of uh, technocratic globalism um, that uh, either um, uh, downplayed these problems or essentially have said, well, you know, you know wait long enough and you'll eventually be better off. Or the third alternative, which is we don't have any choice. Anyhow, this sort of globalization and technological change just falls on our lap and we can't, we can't do anything about it. 
So I think the, the risk really is in terms of these regimes is really avoiding these two extremes of you know, either sort of ethno-nationalist populism or you know, a, a, a something like a technocratic globalism. Um, and, and, and there are plenty of technocratic globalist regimes around the world. I mean, the perfect example today would be Greece. Uh, essentially, where you know basically you know, policies run out of out of um, 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 uh, Brussels and and and, um, and, and, and Berlin and uh, and but many other eurozone countries are in the same zone. So how do you find that middle thing? I think you know that that it, there is no shortage of you know uh, precise ideas or policies about how to fix inequality, how to get at some of these things. But I think what we're lacking is a kind of a narrative, a kind of a language. Uh, that is able to sort of avoid those two extremes. I think one that, that would have to make, I think, patriotism a respectable word again. Um, and I think would have to uh, talk about uh, some kind of an inclusive citizenship um, and, 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 uh, and position itself uh, as much against uh, sort of a technocratic globalism as it does of an ethno-nationalist populism. So you're, you started by talking about the judiciary and the media as two uh, kind of warning signs about when a democracy is in peril and identifying places all over the world in the last decade where a democratically elected leader or group of leaders have, have really sought to dismantle both an independent judiciary and an independent media. And you're, you, I think you're asking a provocative question about what kind of, is there some common cause of the the, the, the challenges to democracy potentially in globalization. Is that a good summary? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah just check. <laughs> Catherine. Yeah. Um, well, I do international relations and the comparative politics of Latin America. So when someone asks me to talk about are democracies in peril, I think globally, I don't and about global trends, and I don't mainly think just about the United States. Um, and and uh, also, I do what I often do when I face an issue, and that is I like to look at trends, I like to look at data. And so I've asked them to put up, uh, but I guess we're not gonna get it up here. There it is. There it is, okay. So one thing I wanna do is just, uh, you know, we wouldn't be at the Kennedy School if we didn't get a little bit of data, right? I wanted you to put up a trend of the number of democracies and non-democracies in the world from 1800 to 2010, okay? And first, I wanna actually correct a mistake that Danny made, but he's an economist, so we don't expect him to, and that election, no, elections alone don't make democracy. No political scientist would tell you the mere presence of elections make democracy. So it's not just elections, any election makes a democracy and you know, these other rule of law makes a liberal democracy. So Turkey does not qualify anymore. It doesn't matter if uh, Turkey had elections, okay? It no longer qualifies as a democracy. Um, so this, uh, <laughs> sorry. No, I'm just saying people may, uh, you know, that's common to make that mistake, but it's important to clarify that, that um, the reason I want to clarify is that this data is not data just about elections. This is data about systems that are competitive, and there's a party competition, participatory, and have the basic rights that make that participation and competition meaningful. Okay, so this is not a, a you know, these are, um, how can I say, these are not easy democracies in this case. So we see a trend of this uh, important growth in democracy. You see the great, the surge in the 90s, which we call the third wave of democracy, and you see around 2000, by the way, the democracies are the, the green line there, the autocracies are the red line, okay, the authoritarian regimes are the red line. We see right around 2000, there's a switch, right, where democracies for the first time in human history overtake autocracies. Okay, so in terms of global trends, what we're worried about is that that democracy line has now flattened out and has that zigzag on it. You know, there are democracies in peril in the world. Okay, and uh, yet I want to put it in a context that suggests, right, that it's that there, um, the peril we're worried about may not be able to reverse these longer historical trends. Um, there's a second slide and I forgot my clicker. Can you change it? There, yay. 
OK, these are the number of people living under different political regimes. Because people might say, OK, number democracy, but what about people? And so the green are, are people living under democracy. The red are people living under autocracy, authoritarian regimes. And the yellow orange are people living under various kinds of semi-democracies. So the trend is equally there when we look at the number of people living under democracy. OK, so um, now I do believe that many democracies in the world are in peril, um, including the United States. Okay. Um, but you know, whether or not uh, we are going to reverse these trends has to do, I think, with um, other things. It, it depends, and it depends a lot on whether people believe in democracy and whether people fight to, to support and sustain their democracies. And I, I completely agree with Marshall. It's about organizing, but not just about organizing. It's about organizing by people who believe in protecting democracy. Um, and so you know, one of our colleagues, Scott Mainwaring, has written an amazing book on democracy, the fall, rise and fall of democracy in Latin America, points out that one of the most important explanations for the, the fall of democracy in Latin America is that people stopped believing in democracy. And not just you know, the right wing stopped believing. The left wing and the right wing stopped believing in democracy. And this contributed to the fall of democracy. So I want to just briefly, in the time remaining, use Venezuela to talk about some of these issues. Because Venezuela is an example. It's not just that Venezuelan democracy is in peril. Venezuela has lost its democracy despite its elections. Okay? And it, um, it, Venezuela, ha a country that had a long-term tradition of democracy. When I started graduate school in 1981, Venezuela was one of two countries in the whole region with Costa Rica that was democratic and that could claim to have a, a sustained democratic history. Um, and so it's, a, it's an illustrative story of how we lose, how we can lose democracy. Um, so Venezuela has become a dictatorship. I don't take that word lightly. I use it precisely. Okay, and um, you know I don't have time. I think some of you know the history. I don't have time to go into it. But part of the story has to do exactly with something that Danny did say, with which I agree very much, and that is this question of the, of the judicial branch. Um, but the dilemma was when elected president Hugo Chavez started to undermine the judiciary, started to pack the Supreme Court. People did not go out and defend the judiciary because they were so enamored with populist, this populist democracy, and here very much picking up on what Jenny said. They were so enamored with the people, the unified people, and the great man, Hugo Chavez, right, that they were willing to see their judiciary basically destroyed. It became a tool, as we've seen recently, a mere tool of the executive branch. Um, and uh, the, so, so the one thing I think that's happening in the world today is that, that's different than the past, is that these new electoral authoritarians, as our colleague Steve Levitsky and the Gov Department has called them, these new electoral authoritarians are kind of smarter than the old coups of the past, right? They, they're doing this transition to authoritarianism gradually. They're flying under the radar in some cases. They're using their power. The, these governments are using their power uh, to, try to, uh, um, to try to bolster the legitimacy. They have more legitimacy because they were elected and because they're not carrying out a military coup in the old style, right? They're carrying out a populist coup of some sort. Um, and what most kind of alarms me about the Venezuela story is that the, the, for a long time, most of Latin America, most of now democratic Latin America gave Venezuela a pass. And a lot of the left in this country did as well. And we did it because, and the, you know, I've had conversations with my, my human rights activist colleagues in Argentina. They said, oh, you know, Chavez is, is doing inclusion. And because he's doing inclusion, we're going to just give him a pass on the judiciary, on the political prisoners, and on the other rights 
and, and rule of law issues that ultimately were undermining democracy. So nowadays, most of us have come to the realization that democracy no longer exists in Venezuela. But we, we ignore the 10 or 15 years where people were trying to pretend it wasn't happening because they wanted to congratulate Chavez on uh, inclusion. Um, and so the, I think the issue here is, is that um, it's, it's very important that people believe in democracy and believe that inclusion ultimately is going to happen best under democracies. And what Nico didn't mention when I, when I said my, I said I learned about democracy in Uruguay in 1976 when I learned what it was like to, to, in its absence. But I also learned about democracy when the Uruguayans in the 1980s and to the present reclaimed their democracy and um, created one of the most vigorous, I think, and vibrant democracies in the world today with deep levels of inclusion. Okay, so we have this notion somehow we need somehow we need this authoritarian edge to be uh, re redistributive and to be inclusionary. But countries like Uruguay tell us a different story that it's possible to have deep democracy and deep inclusion. Thank you. Wow. So, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go right to questions from the audience, even though I have many questions for our panel. So please start gathering at the four microphones here. Uh, and as we do that, I just want to say, this is what I love about this institution. It is a, a, an, an intoxicating mix of ideas and, and, and thinking. Marshall talking about, uh, about equal voice to, and unequal resources and the role of money in, in speech in a democracy. Jenny talking about the dangers of populism. Um, and, and what that unified will of the people, what that means for rights, and also what a solution might look like in the ways we think about immigration policy. Khalil talking about how we have to rewrite our history. We have to, we have, to have a new story for our nation that faces our, the reality of our history. Uh, Megan with a, a hopeful look at, at, the, at the, the challenges the political parties are, are facing, not, not so much perhaps the institutions of democracy. Danny, talking about the judiciary and the media as key institutions we have to carefully watch and about common causes across the globe as we look at these challenges in democracies around the world. And quite appropriately, Catherine, looking at some actual data and some of the global trends and, and thinking about what this means in the context of Venezuela and the, the challenges of opportunity of inclusion in democracies. So I'm going to go, I'm going to start up here at this microphone. This is our first forum, and so I have to remind you there are three crucial rules to asking questions in the forum. One, identify yourself, name and program. Two, keep it brief so we can get as many questions as possible. And three, it must be a question. It ends with a question mark. Please. <laughs> Hello, my name's uh, Tobias Connett. I'm an MPP1. I had a question for uh, Professor O'Sullivan. You say that um, there hasn't been, at least in the US, this cause for optimism because there hasn't been this discussion about whether liberal democracy is the best way to govern the US. But I wonder, given the context that Professor Roderick talks about in, for example, Turkey, or what we see in Venezuela, what you think that discussion would actually look like, and whether you think, for example, Trump's attacks on the press here um, talks about judiciary and its role. Uh, maybe exactly that discussion um, uh, playing out, or, or what you think that would look like instead, because in so many of those regimes, you see liberal democracy is exactly the cloak in which authoritarianism arrives to power. Thank you uh, for that's a great question. Um, you know, I was talking, as I think your question understood, about the United States not about every democracy in the world, because I do think there are democracies in peril. Um, what do I think that conversation would look like? Would I recognize it if I saw it? I think there would be a few elements of it, and one of them is what Catherine talked about. I think there would be complacency. I think that there, uh, we're seeing sort of the opposite of that conversation in my mind, uh, which doesn't mean that, again, I, we should all feel happy and sweetness and light, but the fact that there are people who are out there uh, that the press 
is actually pushing back, that the press is now one of the most important counterbalances uh, to the voice of the President of the United States. The fact that we're seeing people protest, the fact that the courts are, are pushing back on, on a whole variety of things, I think that is the national conversation, and I think that's not one about um, how liberal democracy is maybe not up to snuff, not up to the challenges. So, you know, maybe you're right uh, that I should rephrase that and, and, and not say I don't see that debate about whether liberal democracy um, is appropriate. It's maybe more I don't see the signs that I would expect if people were willing to acquiesce or even welcome a different form of governance because I think it would look as, as Catherine described, um, as it has in, in other parts of the hemisphere. Thanks. Hi, how are you? Um, my name is uh, David Mirrahi. I'm a mid-career student from Venezuela. I was wondering, uh, for Professor uh, Catherine, uh, what are your thoughts on how you run opposition uh, once uh, there is a lack of democracy? How do you run opposition when there is a dictatorship and um, yeah, just a general view on that one. Thanks. It, it, with great difficulty, <laughs> as the because that's the problem when you by the time you've lost the democracy, that's why we have to be so careful about it. Uh, it's a huge struggle against great odds, as the Venezuelan opposition has discovered. And uh, you know, all, all I can suggest here is that we have classes here at the at at uh, the Kennedy School. We have uh, you know, Marshall's class on organizing. We have Doug Johnson's class on strategizing for human rights. And they're all about exactly these issues. How, what about tactics? What kind of tactics? What kind of strategies are going to work for the opposition to be able to work against great odds? But the main, I think, thing to say is that it's very hard and very long. And no one should think it's an easy matter to overcome. Is there anyone else on our panel wants to answer that? Yeah. I'll, I'll just, I think, a lot of you are, are familiar with technology. There are a number of places like Sudan, Somalia, um, where it's impossible to organize elections. Is it possible, and the uh, uh, opposition can't, organize, can't unify very easily because there are thousands of factions. And it's very hard for each of the factions to um, judge how, how, how popular they are um, because uh, they can't have elections. So is it possible to, ident to have an iPhone that you could put a fingerprint in or something like that that would be only for one person, where people could vote, not really a formal electoral vote, but some way of registering opinion so that the scattered opposition could gather support um, and the weaker parts of the opposition could see that they're weaker and that they would then have to make coalitions with the stronger. Um, as it is, it's extremely hard, I think, to organize oppositions where there is either no state or a, um, a very strong authoritarian state that's, that's got, it's, it's gonna put, put people who wanna um, create an opposition in jail. If you, we could use some of this sort of get around the government technology to allow uh, uh, um, oppositions to organize themselves and also to figure out how not to be so disunified we might be in a better shape. So think about it, those of you who've got, uh, who know something about technology. Just, just on that, it's interesting. One of the interesting findings in uh, uh, St. Ep's work is that, that the reliance on the internet um, and on blogging and so forth uh, in lieu of building real organization uh, has, if anything, exacerbated division rather than brought it together. Because you know you flame on the internet and somebody else, and so then everybody's fighting everybody, because there is no coherent structure making decisions. There is no coherent uh, collective capacity to it, and that's one of the real problems. Her work is really, I think, important to understand how, in what ways the social media can help, and in what ways it can inhibit, and the fact that we need to learn how to use it well. Give uh, the name and title. Zainab, Zainab Tufaki. Yeah, she's going to be uh, October 27th. We're having a forum here with uh, Sandra. She's a communication scholar, teaches at UNC, and her book is Twitter and Tear Gas, I think. Yeah. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm Richard Rowe, the Open Learning Exchange. Um, last week, to virtually everyone's surprise, 
the Supreme Court of Kenya invalidated the election of the ruling party and the ruling president of that country. Um, no one expected that. But my question is, was this just a quirk? Or is there something we can learn from this that in fact would help us move forward with the issue of the relationship between the judiciary and, and the election process? Did anybody follow it? Well, I wish I knew enough about Kenya to, to speak uh, knowledgeably about this. I just, uh, I just don't know enough. It, it seems that uh, this, this was uh, a, a, a truly um, a case of uh, independent um, uh, constitutional court that acted as opposed to what often happens, which is a sort of um, a, a court that's uh, politically motivated. Um, I, I just, you know, we just, I think this is, I think it's, this was a very rare case. I think it's the only second time it ever happened in Sub-Saharan Africa. First um, I think there was an earlier case in, uh, but many decades ago, I forget where, but because, the, I, because I, I was part of that discussion, but the, um, uh, and, and I think the, the crucial thing is going, to, is going to be how, what the follow-up is and how the, the Kenyan government responds. Um, Africa is one of these these continents where, you know, when Catherine was showing you these um, sort of rising tide of, of democracy, where in fact that that has been uh, one of the big uh, uh, sources of, of improvement uh, in terms of people's access to the political system and voice, and I think that's been uh, extremely important. Um, and and there are a number of countries that now have had a series of elections, more or less properly run. Uh, but there's also been a lot of backsliding, and Kenya was one of these things. And, and so I think it's, it's going to be a, a question of seeing uh, whether uh, there's going to be self-restraint exercised by, uh, by, by the Kenyan government. I think that it ultimately boils down to the exercise of self-restraint in the expectation that the opposition will in turn in some future state uh, exercise self-restraint uh, among those who are currently incumbent. Anyone else on the panel want to add anything? No, then we'll go next. Um, E.J. Dion, I'm grateful to be a visiting professor here uh, this fall uh, here at, at the Divinity School, the Kennedy School, the short seat senator in the social studies department. And one of the seminars I'm teaching um, has the tabloid title, Donald Trump and the Challenge to Liberal Democracy. And so I'm grateful to this panel full of people I've admired. I can now just show it to my students, sit back and say, look how smart these people are. So thank you so much. Um, I have one observation and two quick questions. Uh, by the way, I want to say if the world had listened to Professor Roderick on some of the costs of globalization, we might not be quite in this fix. Thanks for what you've written about that over the years. Um, uh, one observation, I am with Megan in optimism, and it goes to Marshall's point about the kind of actual organizing by his definition that you're starting to see, even down to the precinct politics level. And we'll see if that endures, but something shifted after election day uh, that I think should make us feel potentially hopeful about this difficult, in some ways terrible moment, possibly leading us uh, to some place we'd actually like to be. Um, but I think Professor Roderick's point on the judiciary and the media, and I would add demonization to, of the opposition, are why the Trump moment is disconcerting and gives us things to watch carefully. Because I think in each of those areas, the judiciary, we've seen it right from the beginning, his attitude toward the press, and a particular kind of demonization of opposition is something we have to watch because that begins to cross the line into something that's no longer a liberal democracy. My two questions, and this goes to Jenny Mansbridge's point, um, there's a lot of debate about what is triggering the reaction against liberal democracy or right-wing authoritarianism, however you want to phrase it. Uh, is it primarily about immigration, identity, in some cases race, uh, national assertion, or is it a response to economic disorder, uh, particular problems that the working class in the wealthier nations is facing, because, are, are, uh, is facing because of globalization. I'm just curious how you assess the relative importance uh, of identity immigration uh, and race uh, versus economics. Uh, and the uh, other question, specifically to Professor Muhammad, uh, 
Um, I appreciated your attention to American history. And one of the things that fascinates me is the cycles we have seen on the issue of race and equality. We went to Reconstruction and then we went to Jim Crow. There was a backlash against Reconstruction. We had a civil rights movement begin to grow really in the 40s, and, you know, partly an interesting alliance between African Americans and parts of the labor movement, A. Philip Randolph being a significant figure, uh, you know, a push all the way through the 60s that was quite successful, and then a series of partial backlashes ever since, and then a particularly strong one now. I think the voting rights uh, rollback is, the, to me, the most disconcerting. Um, what is your reading of what, uh, first of all, do you agree that there is some sense of something cyclical uh, about how our country has uh, behaved politically on this question? And uh, if so, do you have any analysis? And I thank you all for uh, being here tonight. So Jenny. You asked for my assessment of the balance between these factors. I think the economic factors are, are, are the greatest uh, cause. And I quote Donnie as saying that governments have given up their responsibilities um, in response to these changing economic factors. So it's a mixture of the economic changes that are producing insecurities through the working class in many, many countries, governments having given up their responsibilities to try to redress that, but, and identity. And I, I think when times are good, people can take a lot of change. Uh, people, we're adaptable species. Um, we're, we, we create the forum. We, we, we're, we're, we're always trying to think our way out of our traps. Um, and that's good. But when things are going badly, I think we retreat to, uh, to stop. We don't think as hard. Um, I think, in fact, psychologists show that um, that, that, that tends to be the case. So, um, so I would, that's why I intentionally use the word trigger. That, that you can have a small thing, relat relatively small proportionally in the causal mix, but that can have, an, can have a triggering role. Um, and then when something's a trigger and you say, sort of, well, what's the, <laughs> what's the proportionality? Um, the trigger may be the, the, what, pro what Aristotle would call the proximate cause, the, the immediate cause, but the larger cause is this constellation of factors having to do with globalization, technology, I, th I believe, and the growing insecurity of many, many uh, people. So that's. I just would like to mention one factor that hasn't been mentioned yet in terms of US democracy, and that's the issue of non-voting. OK, 40% of people in this country didn't vote. That means more people didn't vote than voted for either of the two candidates. The non-voters called this election. Part of the non-voters were, were voter suppression, okay? But part of the non-voters were people who didn't get around to voting, didn't believe that voting was important enough, or even believed that it was a principled position to not vote. And I think that, it, that that's something that we also need to talk about. Um, and we, we see in this country that we have a right to vote, and we have a right not to vote. But we don't talk about whether we have a civic duty to vote. We don't talk about the role that universities could play in trying to get more people to vote. And we don't talk about our own role in trying to mobilize, make sure all of our, all of our communities are out to vote. And so I just want to put that there as well, which is the participation is a, is a central factor of democracy, and at least in this country, our participation rates are dismal. Uh, and among young people, is very high. 50% of young people in this country didn't vote. Yeah, yeah I just want to comment on that. Uh, people vote when they think they have something to vote for. Uh, and I think to attribute non-voting in the United States to just a lack of interest is really to misdiagnose what's going on. In a presidential election, for example, if you live in New York, whether you vote or not makes no difference. Mm -hmm. If you live in California, it makes no difference. If you live in Illinois, it makes no difference. If you live in Texas, it makes no difference because of the electoral college system that makes majority voting irrelevant in state after state. Uh, with, you have the first by the post electoral district. If you get 51%, you get 100% of the representation. 49%, you get zero. Now, there are a lot of institutional reasons that are built in that discourage voting. 
And coupled with the fact that who, when people turn out to vote, it's because people are mobilizing them to turn out to vote. And so then where you have uh, the way the, see the political technology, it's really important to appreciate how the mechanics of democracy work or don't work. And when there's no incentive to mobilize, whoops, keep going. Oh, that was dramatic. When there's no incentive, when there's no incentive to turn people out, you have no get out the vote campaigns in all the states I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So when we look at Hillary got a three million vote majority uh, in the popular vote, uh, if there had been voter mobilization in those states, it would have been a lot more than three million, but it wouldn't have changed the outcome of the election. Mm -hmm. So I think we really have to look at how it is that we construct political choices, what the incentives are to mobilize people, and not just say, well, people aren't voting because they don't care. Uh, I think it makes a huge difference about whether it actually can make a difference or not, and that's the challenge we face is to, I think, address that one. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you, but I also think we need to talk about responsibility, and that is it, um, that it's also important that we as a country talk about a civic duty to vote. Khalil, on the second question EJ raised about kind of cycles of, uh, of uh, you know, more equality and then the, 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 the response, do you agree with that kind of assessment of history and where are we? Is this, is Trump in part a backlash? <clears throat> so I want to answer that question by way of a response to the first question to Ginny. So uh, I, I try to describe a situation where uh, we often retreat to a false dichotomy between our race problem and our economic problem, yeah. that these things are not mutually constitutive. And so I'm just going to make a simple case for it and uh, an invitation to debate at some other time. Um, so I would argue that all forms of populism in US history, and it's debatable whether we call these things all populism, but going back to Bacon's Rebellion in the 17th century, uh, which was about landless European immigrants, indentures, uh, trying to figure out where they sit in this newly evolving class hierarchy, um, was resolved uh, by uh, ultimately uh, violence towards Native Americans and the enslavement of Africans under a racialized chattel system that was in the making. And you can track just about every century when white people have had enough of the insecurity that they experience in an evolving capitalist economy uh, that there'll be either land taken or stolen uh, from indigenous populations or enslaved uh, Africans uh, harnessed to some productive capacity or degraded immigrants from Asia uh, or from the Caribbean or from Latin America brought in up through the Bracero program even to today for Mexican immigrants to resolve that economic security. So my argument would be that it's not an either or, that what we see, one argument or theory would be that the election of President Obama represented the end of the idea or at least the perception that you could harness effectively um, these centuries long sources of resolving white economic insecurity. And the notion in the end that with the symbolic representation of an African American in the White House, let's not forget the birther lie, which seems somehow to just make us uncomfortable, we move on, <laughs> but it's there. Um, that the election of an African American might propose in the 21st century the fundamental coming to terms with the fact that white working class economic insecurity is no different than black economic insecurity, is no different than the social proximity that whites feel with re regard to their Hispanic neighbors in Houston or anywhere else in, in the southwest por portions of this country. So that's, that would be my response to the question about this question of economics versus race. Now, the cyclical nature can be answered also by virtue of the question raised uh, uh, about where do you find dissent. So one of the calls to this history is that you could find any number of analogies or make any number of arguments that uh, these same groups, these outgroups in America, have ex lived under various forms of anti-democratic regimes or fascist regimes over these long histories that I've described. And we have a really have hard time in the United States teaching and participating in a civic culture where we have to simultaneously acknowledge the greatness of a nation of laws and democracy in the beacon to the world, and at the same time that many people live under fascism in the United States. 
And we could argue, we could have a debate about whether it is less fascist today in certain parts of the country than it used to be, but the fact remains uh, that people have experienced, so the question of dissent, through the effort of those living under oppressive regimes in this country, there are any number of lessons about how you build constituency, how you organize, how you make allyship, how you move the political needle, how you transform political parties. I mean, we forget that the entire shift of the only two political parties we've had in the modern era turned on the question of race and racism and the place that black people would fit in this society. So these things are not incidental at all in any way, shape, or form, but our historical literacy on this stuff is about nil. Um, and so to your question of cyclical retreat, how, yes, absolutely. And I would argue, again, as a theory, uh, is that it takes about two generations to forget all the pain and suffering, all the dissent, all the living under fascism, um, to then come back around and say, oh, my god, um, you know, we transcended yet another moment. But no, we haven't, because we're setting in motion a new generation of people who drink and imbibe the same narrative we've been telling from the very beginning, that we are a great chosen people. We do wonderful things. We help everybody in the world. And lo and behold, it turns out that, you know, that if we're going to get there, that is a product of vigilance and not a product of forgetting. I have one thing to this. Just that, that I just want to complicate it a little bit by throwing gender into the mix and, and, and suggest that inequality is inequality. And, you know, the question of racial inequality, economic inequality, gender based inequality, unless they're tackled together, they're not tackled successfully. In other words, you can't fix one without the other. We showed, I showed my class today uh, Dr. King's uh, talk, often called the I Have a Dream speech, but which is actually the fierce urgency of now. And the fierce urgency of now speech, 1963, was a march for jobs and freedom. It wasn't just freedom in terms of racial terms, it was also jobs. And I think that unless we get clear that if we, ta if we don't tackle gender inequality, racial inequality, economic inequality together, then the ones we don't tackle drag the rest down. And, and I think that's our challenge. I mean, a lot of people woke up on November 9th and discovered there were problems in America. There's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of people who have known all their lives there's problems in America. And the challenge is to bring that together in enough of a political force to be able to attack all those inequalities in order to give this democracy a better chance, I think. So uh, on the subject of gender, I'm gonna give our last question to, uh, uh, to the only woman to ask a question tonight so far, but please. It's not a question about women. I apologize for that. Um, you're falling down. And you're but I am a feminist, but so anyway. Um, I have one question, but to ask it, I need to make two remarks before that I'm going to do really briefly. Uh, first, my name is Sahara Marir. I'm in the Master in Middle Eastern Studies. Um, so, Professor uh, Mansbridge, you talked about immigration um, in Europe and uh, made, uh, mentioned that it's a trigger for the populist and for right, uh, rise the rise of the far right and the fact that we need to find a way to change immigration laws and still be generous with the people coming. Um, I just want to, uh, to emphasize the fact that it's not us uh, that are just uh, offering opportunities to immigrants who are coming, they are giving us opportunities. Germany needs immigrants to keep the welfare state. France needs immigrants for the low uh, income jobs and the highest qualified jobs. We need them more than need, they need us. Um, and Professor uh, O'Sullivan, when you talked, I, I am French, uh, when you talked about uh, the fact that Fillon uh, supported Macron, uh, first, I want to um, just, the, your comment is extremely misleading. Macron is absolutely, absolutely not a socialist. He is a regular right-wing candidate. <coughs> Fillon is a hard-right candidate. And Marine Le Pen is a far-right candidate. And Fillon hesitated before supporting Macron. Um, so, and the whole hard right uh, hesitated. And Fillon, when he was under Sarkozy, he, he, he implemented, he and Sarkozy helped implement uh, policies that are regularly just policies that pertain to the far right in France. And the only thing that changed is that it was socially acceptable because it wasn't done by the far right, it was done by the hard right. So there is technically, theoretically, very few differences between the hard right in France and the far right except the label. So this comes to my <coughs> question. Uh, 
I do have a question. Um, so don't you think that democracies are also in peril because of what I call fake liberalism? So it's very fashionable and socially acceptable to call yourself liberal and being open-minded and open to other people. But every time our societies are confronted with these issues, uh, we see that uh, the white uh, privileged people uh, have always this tendency to be extremely lenient uh, with uh, the populist. So th I understand that as political scientists, we need to explain phenomenons, but there is a huge difference between explaining and justifying. And what a lot of us are doing here is justify the hate that uh, these populists and the far rights have for immigrants, uh, immigration, anyone that is different by sexual or uh, orientation or gender or whatever. So don't you think that this is also why our democracies are in peril? Because every time we are asked to stand up for minorities and in people who are endangered, every time we have to wait until we arrived, until we arrived to cases where Trump is, is leading the country, where in France Marine Le Pen al almost led the country, and then we have people that only stand up to radicals but never stand up to soft bigotry that exists constantly and is constantly present in the right wing in France, they're constantly present in the Republican Party in the US. And we don't need to have radicals like Trump to, um, to actually um, fight them, but those people only stand up when in front of radicals and never in front of soft bigotry. Very quickly, yes, um, I agree completely that the uh, immigrants help the economy in the US um, overall. But I think it's a little bit like free trade in that um, you get the benefits overall, but some, some, in, some areas or individuals bear concentrated, uh, have concentrated problems. So I think um, I'm very much in favor of things like the groups of five in Canada where you can organize to welcome, that's refugees, not, other, not economic immigrants. But there are many things that we could do um, in this country and in other countries, um, not only to welcome immigrants in a better way, but also to be careful of the burdens that might be concentrated in specific areas. Like people, everybody in this room really does, I think none of us in any way um, are our, our, nothing in our lives has gotten worse because of immigrants, quite the contrary. I would say that for every single person in this room, immigration is a huge benefit, uh, culturally, economically, um, but that's not, but I think we sometimes forget that that's not true of every single person. So we have to, I think, try to figure out ways uh, that the winners, namely us, uh, find out ways of, of protecting the losers a bit better. And I, I think that if we think about this idea constructively, we, we can begin to come up with ideas of how to do that. Anyone else on the panel? Yes, and um, I'm gonna resist the urge to debate French political later. <laughs> with you. Maybe we can do that offline. Um, I, I'd just like to respond. I, I really appreciate your passion, and I actually agree with your point about soft bigotry needing to be opposed as much as radicals. The one thing I would say, and this is just part of my reaction, uh, not a direct reaction, is that we also have to be careful that we don't label the other so entirely. So um, what I mean by that is that I had maybe my most memorable discussion in the 10 years that I've been at the Kennedy School in my classroom the morning after the election in November. And um, one of my students stood up and explained why he voted for Trump. And this was actually quite a brave thing to do in that exact moment <laughs> in time. And I thought he made points that were really important and I think not acknowledged enough. I think the minute he said he voted for Trump, um, sure there were people in that classroom who just decided they attributed all kinds of things to him. And he made a point. He said, look, I abhor his treatment of women. I abhor his positions on immigrants, but I voted for him for this reason. It, it was an economic reason. Um, I'm not saying that everyone who is a Trump supporter needs to be looked at sympathetically. And, but I'm also saying that for us to say anyone who's in that category, we shouldn't, if they raise an economic issue, we shouldn't say they're just disguising that for 
racism and bigotry and other things, that there may be legitimate reasons why people did vote for Trump. And we need to just keep in mind that there's a spectrum of people out there um, and that we need to call injustices as we see them. But to come at the issue assuming that everybody who has supported President Trump or the Republican Party ascribes to a whole set of values which most people in this room would reject, I think doesn't do us a service. You're going to announce the music. On that note, on that note, uh, I have three quick things. First, September 11th, Monday, 8 p.m. I think there's a forum. And then at 8 p.m., we're going to have a pizza party with uh, all of you, with students, to continue this discussion of democracies in peril and what students at the Kennedy School can do about it. Uh, did I get that right, I think? Uh, yeah, but it's not just continue the discussion. It's we'd really like to have this year be a year of intense discussion. And we don't know how to create intense discussion among the students. But you guys do. So you put on your entrepreneurial caps and come to this pizza party with ideas for what we should do in the future. The dean will fund various things if you come up with some good ideas. So come up with some ideas about how we can make this a really galvanizing uh, 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 year for, for everybody here. I think the, the, the Fainsod room on the third floor is where that's going to be. Next, today is the 40th anniversary of the launch of the Voyager 1 space probe. It has left our solar system, the first man-made object to leave our solar system. And if you need a moment to have hope about where humanity is going, the scientists who launched that put a 90-minute record for any aliens that might find it, where they tried to capture the beauty of humanity. And go find that playlist online and listen to it. It is really quite exceptional. And finally, I want to thank our panelists. Round of applause. <laughs> So, yeah. Good to get this finished.